All over our cities, along our coastlines and across our green and pleasant land, an invisible army is fighting a never-ending war. Their enemy is the filth that we create and the vermin that thrive on it. Welcome to the hidden world of the Grime Fighters. On Grime Fighters tonight, Dagnum property manager Tony despairs. Another room of delights. Litter picker Lou gets romantic. Can you imagine making love in an alleyway like this? Art restorer Mark diligently deals with what the barn owls left behind. This kind of level of droppings is sort of you know, bigger than anything I had to deal with before. An enforcement officer Mitch is shocked. I have to tell you, I've never come across a, a site like this before. An Englishman's home is his castle. But Dagenham housing manager Tony has to deal with some of the council properties that look like dungeons. This morning, he's come to assess a terraced house in the borough. The tenants have been evicted, and he has to get the property cleared, refurbished, and back on the rental market as quickly as possible. All right, another void in Dagenham. I wonder what we'll find in this one. Words can't describe what confronts him. <sighs> For Tony, this could be the start of a bad day. Absolutely lovely. To say the least, it's not very pleasant. It's absolutely full of rubbish and flies. Absolutely reeks. The further you get into it, the worse it gets. Immediately, it's obvious that this is yet another nightmare property. But what's depressing is that he's seeing more and more of them. The general trend is the properties are getting as bad as this. Unfortunately, this is becoming the norm. This is probably getting to 50% of our properties, this. It's a bit sad, really. But Tony soon discovers one of the reasons why this kind of devastation is all too common. I don't know if you see in there, there's, um, there's a syringe. So there's a good chance that they've been taking drugs in it. It could be sharps anywhere. Also, it's, it's all the signs of everything else. There's, there's, there's more cans of cider, the old favourite. What makes the situation worse is that there's evidence that children were also living in these conditions. It seems that nobody's got any pride, they've got no concern for how they live. If they've got kids, it's going to affect the kids. When the kids get older, if they're living in this, they're going to think it's the norm, and you've got another generation that's going to live like this. And I mean, as for the kids seeing, obviously, we've had drug taking, cannabis smoking, every drinking, God knows what it's done to the kids. It's just sad. It just makes you wonder what in their life has got them to this stage. And I don't suppose we'll ever know. Tony needs to assess the rest of the property quickly so he can get it cleared and refurbished as soon as possible. But things aren't getting any easier. <sighs> Another room of delights. In Wolverhampton, Lou, the city's proudest litter picker, is embarking on another shift. First call is a small fly tip. Hey, see me in the cave before? I'm like a big lump of rubbish, eh? I? Lou's long-term partner, Dave, has left. Now he's working with Gary and Sam. But this morning, he's also got other, less welcome company. Looks like we've got a bit of company with the Rockweiler over the fence, so we'll uh, be as quick as we can here. Yeah? Fortunately, Lou seems to be taking the change to his daily routine in his stride. David's been transferred uh, to another contract, and uh, now I'll work with Sam and Gary. So we're doing a bit of bonding and getting together now. Do I miss Dave? I do. He never stopped telling me jokes, did he? But if Gary and Sam think the ribbing will stop now Dave's gone, they're very much mistaken. Gary shouts at me a lot, but I can take it. Because he lives with his mother than Gary does. He ain't married, am you, Gaz? No. no. He likes his lager too much. I bet they've snails. You like snails, don't you? <laughs> hey? Oh, sorry, he's Italian. I thought he was French. The joking's over and the dog's antics are finally getting to Lou. All these tyres, I just can't work it out. Just a breeding ground for rats. Mind you, I'll tell you something. If there's any rats here that have an headache off that dog because it's giving me a bloody headache, I tell you. With the fly tip cleared, Lou can spruce up the nearby alley. Me and Gary's going to have a quick litter pick up here, just to make it look a bit tidy. The odd bit of rubbish provides a welcome distraction from the dog. Yes, that's the direct packet here that's uh, looked like it's been open. Well, it's not there. 
Can you imagine making love in an alleyway like this? No, I can't either. But all too quickly, the dog gets its way. We're here working, but people live here. Could you live next door to a dog that was barking like that all day? No, well, I couldn't, I'll tell you now. With the alley clear, Lou and the boys can move on to more peaceful surroundings. Come on, lads, let's get away from here. In Dagenham, Essex, council property manager Tony is continuing his assessment of the nightmare two-bedroom house. It's onto the kitchen and downstairs bathroom. Another major operation. Look at the cooker and that. You can imagine what, what it must have been like when they were living here. And up these walls and um, it's just covered with absolute filth. I just wonder if this is a resident in the bath. It seems to be a door fetish in Bargain and Dagenham. I don't know whether that's supposed to be a repair. Why put that on there when you've got that, that and that? It's obviously been done um, on purpose. That's not accidental. It's, it's not as if, uh, oh dear, I banged into it. I mean, that's been punched. <clears throat> it's actually that one there. As you can see, it's absolutely right through the door. I mean, there's some punch to go through that. Which just seems a total and absolute waste of time. Finally, it's time to venture upstairs. Right. Oh, another nice, neat, tidy bedroom. Yeah, we was, we was obviously right about the kids. So we can safely say that there were more children and bedrooms here. Obviously, they're a bit cramped, so they've not bothered to ask for a move, because normally the council are very good with um, people who need to move, that have got children that need bedrooms. Obviously, they weren't too worried about the kids being cramped up, I wouldn't have thought. Amongst the clutter, some more interesting items catch Tony's eye. Underwear, whips. <laughs> That's quite common as well. And with the amount of flies that are in here, it's probably for fly swatting, I don't know, but they seem to get an awful lot. Tony has now seen enough. There's no time to lose in getting this place cleared and the honour falls to extreme cleaners Gary and Luke. Suited and booted, the boys can look forward to the grisly task ahead. When it comes to a career in crime fighting, the opportunities are endless and infinitely diverse. Here at West Wickham Park in Buckinghamshire, a roosting barn owl has ruined a small section of the 18th century paintings which adorn one of the classical facades. The National Trust is relying on the skill of specialist restorer Mark to painstakingly clean the painting. This kind of level of droppings is sort of you know, bigger than anything we've had to, uh, had to deal with before. It's a very delicate um, painted surface. Um, it's one of the very, very few external wall paintings in England um, left. In fact, West Wickham is incredibly fortunate in that it's got quite a few of them. We've basically got to do this um, using only dry dry methods because the paint surface is um, quite soluble um, in water so we're going to have to um, try and do it without using any any liquid. So Mark needs to identify which tools he needs for the job. I'm going to try out various different types of brushes and uh, see which one of those works. They're sort of stencil brushes and cut down paint brushes and things. Um, I've also got um, these sponges uh, called Wishab sponges. They're self-abrading granular rubber. You can cut them into sort of wedges and basically they abrade against the surface and roll up the dirt um, and droppings in this case. Armed with his weapons of choice, Mark climbs the scaffolding to take a closer look at the damage. Well, it's pretty bad. A lot of the white droppings, which I think should be reasonably easy to um, remove. It's just almost like a, like a white lime wash has been splattered on it. The darker bits look like they're a bit thicker and therefore they may be a bit harder to remove. It's a lot of sort of insect debris and cobwebs. So what I'm gonna do is just give it a bit of a, a dust down first and just get rid of anything that's loose that comes off first and then we know that we're left just with the droppings. After gently brushing away the surface debris, Mark tries out his brushes on the paintwork itself. Just going to try a fiberglass brush that I put on a, a surgical glove so we don't get the fibres in sticking in the hand. The fiberglass brush seems to be breaking the surface, and together with the sponge, they might prove to be the perfect combination. 
It seems to be coming off reasonably easily. Both the fiberglass brush and the sponge. The sponge might well be the way to go. And one of the nice things about these sponges is that they're very, very gentle. Mark has identified the way forward thanks to his experience and, most importantly, his patience. Now he can return the painting to its former glory. But cleaning this area is likely to take Mark a week. Coming up, Litter Picker Lou flourishes in flowers. Extreme cleaners Gary and Luke confront the Dagenham house. Nice syringe there, sitting there in the children's room amongst the toys. And environmental enforcement officer Mitch deals with a typical Saturday night in London Soho. Throughout the country, an army of professionals are continuing to dedicate their daily lives to waging war on the nation's grime. In Wolverhampton, the sun is shining and Lou, the city's proudest, has moved off the streets to gentler surroundings. The ornate gardens and boating lake in West Park. The general workers are, are really busy. All right, lads, carry on, thank you. For Lou, there's good reason for his improving mood. Today, they've asked me to come into the park just to help out. Uh, there's a couple of lads that normally do this job are on holiday. You know, I'm used to going out there on the streets, fly tipping, complete and utter change for me. I absolutely love it, but obviously, if they give me the chance to come into the park to do a bit like this, I jump at it and I come here racing because I enjoy it. As well as the general litter, the main problem in the park is caused by the water birds. The only way to remove the evidence is to rake it off the surface. Oh, look, a dead fish. Ah, oh, look at that. Looks like we're saving Nemo. We put this over here safe so somebody could claim it later. We'll put it on here. For a change, it's not rubbish in the park, it's what nature has left behind. The people that use this, the general public, keep this clean because it looks nice. If it's clean, they look after it, and this is what tends to happen in this park. With the barrow empty, Lou is on song. Singing cockles and mussel and antilivo. The next stop is one of Lou's favourite parts of the city. Absolutely gorgeous. This is our masterpiece. This is the centrepiece of the park. Just cast your eyes over here and see how wonderful it looks. Me and the lads here are just going to have a quick walk round the park and uh, pick any litter up, all right? A quick whiz round to admire the view. It seems a perfect end to what could have been a very difficult day. In Dagenham, extreme cleaners Gary and Luke are making good headway clearing the two-bed house. Amazingly, the boys have spent most of their lives working as a team. We were in a school together and then uh, joined the army together, and now we do this together. Gary and Luke served their country in Bosnia and Germany. Being in the army has stood them in good stead to deal with the challenges of extreme cleaning. You don't mind what you're going to go to, you just get on with the job and just do it really. I suppose like in the army, you, that's, that's the way. If you get given a task, you go and do it, and, you, and do the job well. So you just do exactly the same with this really. Having worked together for so long also helps with the daily grind. So it's nice to come work with your best mate every day. You know, you just crack on together and get it done. So, I mean, we're both pretty similar personalities and that. We don't moan, we just sort of get on with it, you know. If you're standing there moaning about it, you've wasted time and he'll be getting on with it, you know. As they delve further, some family secrets come to light. You do find the pool magazines and um, videos and whatever else and you get the sex toys along with it as well. No, it shocks me at all no more. But mixing drug taking and children gets pretty close. Nice syringe there, sitting there in the children's room amongst the toys. They shouldn't be having syringes and needles around them. So it does make you sad, really. It's horrible. It's all because I walk my kids like uh, living like it. I don't think anyone would really. After a morning of hard graft and too many trips to the dump, Gary and Luke have eventually cleared the house. All done. All done. Job done. I've got to admit, I didn't think it'd be free lorry loads. No, definitely not. <laughs> but uh, it's sometimes more. it's deceiving. That's us. Done. With the house empty, Tony can make his final assessment. It's not as bad as he thought, apart from the kitchen. <laughs> it's not really improved the kitchen by removing the stuff. In actual fact, you can see how dirty it is now. It's absolutely filthy. 
how they could possibly eat anything in here. It's beyond me. Just uh, absolutely awful. Tony can now tell his refurbishment team to come in and transform the property. As always, he remains optimistic. We don't give up, we just keep on plodding on and try and get them to the best standard as we can. Eventually we'll get somebody in there that'll respect the place, you know, and is pleased just to get a council place. Unfortunately, we seem to get a lot that just want to wreck them. It's Saturday night in London's West End, and Westminster Council Enforcement Officer Mitch is patrolling the streets. Some of the one million daily visitors are drinking the night away. It's up to Mitch to tackle illegally dumped rubbish and the grim legacy of excessive partying. He also has to deal with some more unusual situations. I have to tell you, I've never come across a, a site like this before. Five people underneath two sleeping bags in the open street, under no cover whatsoever. Hello? Hello? I'm afraid they're well out of it. With no response, Mitch hasn't any option but to phone the police to move them on. OK, that's been reported to our colleagues over um, in the Metropolitan Police. They'll be down here very shortly and they're uh, moving them on. But luckily, there are signs of life. They are moving on and that's the best thing and they're, um, they're all going their separate ways, which is probably even better. Mitch has to confront anything that's thrown at him during his shift, but he reckons his presence on the streets is appreciated. I think the, for the many members of the public, many members of our customers, really, the city inspector is the fourth emergency service in Westminster. The public pretty much have um, a respect and appreciation for the hard work That's that we true. have to do. <laughs> the hard work we have to do. Not all the public, right? <laughs> but in a back alley in Soho, there are some things that Mitch wishes he didn't have to sort out. We've got the, the, the real nasty side of human fouling. We've got uh, excrement along the wall and on the ground here and lots of urine. It's um, pretty horrendous, guys. It's not good, not good at all. I'm going to get that cleared up now. Mitch summons a vehicle called the Street Flusher. Westminster Council are the only local authority in the country to run this 24-hour service. That's a lot better. Pretty appalling sight. Some very, very dirty people. It's the nastier side of the job, but it looks better and it smells better, and I'm pretty happy with that now. Moments after the street flusher departs, there's trouble again, despite one of Mitch's temporary urinals being parked just a few feet away. And what's that, sir? <laughs> Classic case. Someone just not opening their eyes. A public urinal sitting slap bang in the middle of the street and a chap just walked around and attempted to uh, urinate against the fence in here. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Do I have to go and demonstrate it? In the early hours, with most of the revellers gone, Mitch discovers a little memento on Charing Cross Road. <laughs> OK, so it's about 2.30 in the morning. Someone has had, I take it, an entertaining night. And we've got to get it cleaned, get it cleaned up. We don't want anyone slipping in that. Mitch has to recall the street flushing vehicle. It's um, very wet, uh, very fresh. But as always, he remains upbeat. We've seen and confronted all three forms of human fouling, and what an incredible night. <laughs> I hope you're pleased, because I'm certainly not. <laughs> As morning breaks over West Wickham Park, specialist restorer Mark comes to the end of his painstaking task cleaning some 18th century wall paintings. He's been here so long, he's become part of the furniture. It's taken the five days that I estimated it, it would do. We're just coming down to the, to the last couple of feet. The droppings have sort of have thinned out quite a bit here. The worst of the damage was obviously at the top. By the time we get down to the bottom here, it's much more, it's much thinner and the droppings are more just the sort of the white, almost like a lime wash. It doesn't have so much of the urine and the, and the actual faeces and so on involved with it. So it's considerably easier to clean off. It's just almost like a surface dusting. Mark has spent the week diligently working away, removing all evidence of the barn owl with his fiberglass brushes and abrasive sponges. 
In his daily routine, Mark is required to clean up after bats and many different species of birds. But owls cause the most difficulty. Owl poo is particularly dangerous to paintings and other vulnerable surfaces because of their diet, um, which is sort of insects and small animals and so on. You get um, a lot of nitrates in the faeces, which is uh, alkaline and caustic, and that will obviously eat into the surface of the vulnerable paint. Um, it also is combined with uric acid from the urea, the urine, uh, and the two in combination are sort of a pretty violent cocktail for any kind of sensitive decorative surfaces. The National Trust now want to make sure that in future, paintings and birds won't mix. Some spikes have been put in along the top to stop roosting happening, either from owls or from pigeons or any other kind of birds, and obviously prevention is better than cure. After a week of laborious endeavour, Mark congratulates himself on a job well done. I think this, this does make the East Portico paintings look much more cared for. I think before when the droppings were essentially disfiguring the whole of this corner, it looked as though nobody really cared about what's you know, a terribly important painting. It's improved it and hopefully the public will appreciate that and, and also take on board the need for you know, sort of constant maintenance that all these, these buildings have to have. One person would agree, if he could, Giuseppe Mattia Borgnis the artist who painted this masterpiece some 260 years ago. After the filming of the programme, Dagenham property manager Tony gave the go-ahead for refurbishment of the two-bed house. And now Mark's work at West Wickham is finished, the complete restoration of the paintings will begin shortly.